if we're not able to slow down this rise in temperature before, say, we melt in more of the permafrost and release more methane into the atmosphere, then it's not going to make any difference who's president 10 years from now. They won't be able to any longer do much about it. I'm most excited about the fact that I think we've done a reasonable job of getting for the first time some basic scientific understanding into this debate. 18 months ago, nobody had heard of this number 350, the most important number in the world. Now, though it's not going to be reflected in the final agreement, uh, it's clearly helping drive the process. Uh, the fact that there are real people from many places making urgent demands for serious action, not for an agreement on climate, but for an agreement that's big enough to have some effect on what actually happens. The agreement that comes out of here won't be that, but it'll be closer to that, and we'll have more of a movement demanding that, and we will have heightened the stakes some, and we will have pointed out just how ridiculous much of the posturing that passes for negotiation among the rich and powerful countries really is. Rehash this really quickly where the number 350 from. Summer of 2007, the Arctic melts. All of a sudden it becomes very clear even to those of us who've been following this for a long time, and I wrote the first book about all of this 20 years ago this fall, it becomes very clear that change is happening much faster than we expected and on a larger scale becomes very clear that climate is not a problem for the future, but a present emergency. A bunch of research teams go back to work trying to calibrate now, given all this real-time data, what we can say. By January of 08, the NASA team, headed by Jim Hansen, publishes a paper saying, 350 is the number, kids. Uh, uh, any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed or to which life on Earth is adapted. That's strong language. Stronger if you know that we're already well past 350. Outside the Bella Center here, it's about 390 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, and the same in every other place on the globe. That's why the ice caps are melting. That's why the negotiations here in certain way are such a joke. Um, the latest set of proposals that various countries have proffered when you cram them into a computer and crunch them all produces a world of 650 parts per million carbon dioxide. We're not close to being on the right track and, and that's why there's a certain amount of, uh, of anger and unease from people who a, know what's going on, and B, live in the places that are going to be destroyed first. You took that number 350, did some really special things with it, you know, campaign. Tell us about that. Well, we built a large campaign, oddly enough, because we didn't have much money or organization to begin with. There were seven of us, and so everybody took, they were all young except for me, everybody took a continent and went out and started organizing. And we found other young people, mostly in faith communities and things all over the world who were eager to go to work. On October 24th, we had a big global day of action. And in fact, CNN, by the end of the weekend, was describing it as the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history on any issue. And there were 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. There wasn't a rock star or a movie star in sight all there was was people rallying around this somewhat obscure scientific data point. Don't tell me ever that people can't understand complexity, and don't tell me ever that environmentalism is something for rich white people, because we had 15,000 people in the streets of Addis Ababa, and I can show you the 20-year-old sisters who made that happen. They're here with us this week. We had people out everywhere demanding real science-based change. That doesn't mean that they easily beat ExxonMobil, you know. ExxonMobil made more money last year than any company in the history of money. And they're using it to hang on to their privileged position atop the world economy, atmosphere be damned. Um, we've got to build a bigger movement yet. Was it a breakthrough to give people a firm, concrete number to understand to rally around? 
I think it was a good idea, and I think that more all the time when I'm here, and I look at how much of civil society activity is all, you know, sort of posters and things all about, you know, we need an agreement or we want change or something like that. That's not the problem. There's going to be 100 world leaders here. You don't put 100 world leaders, heads of state in a room and not produce an agreement. They're going to produce some piece of paper. The question's going to be, is it good enough to do anything? And that's why we needed to get this bottom line out there in the world so we'd have some way of saying, you guys are joking, right? This isn't getting us where we need to go. We need more. Uh, you'll be participating in quite a few panels and events, and you'll be at the Clean Forum on, on Monday. But what are you most excited about what you'll participate in? in your <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm mostly just excited about seeing all the... Uh, young people from all over the world that I've been working with all year. For me, it's like, uh, you know, uh, re like running my year in reverse because I've been the one moving part of this whole 350 thing. I've been in every corner of the world. So now every time I turn a corner here, there's another 23-year-old who I spent a week with, you know, bopping around the roads of New Zealand or hiking around the mountains of Lebanon or something, uh, working on climate stuff, and they're all here, and it's great to just see them and get a big hug, and uh, on we go. So they're keeping you forever young? No, I don't know about that. I feel a deal older than I did a year ago, but uh, uh, they're doing the work, and it's really exciting to see. Monday I'll be at the Klima Forum with President Nasheed, Mohammed Nasheed, who's my favorite of world leaders. If Barack Obama was doing what Nasheed is doing, we'd be really rocking and rolling. This guy is great. He gets the science. He's willing to put it all on the line. He understands gesture and symbolism. He trained his whole cabinet in scuba diving this fall so that they could hold an underwater cabinet meeting to pass a 350 resolution and send it here to Copenhagen. He's the real deal. Uh, uh, and among other things, it's wonderful to see leadership on these issues coming from the Muslim world. Uh, the Maldives is an entirely Muslim country. Uh, you mentioned President Obama. What words would you have for him? Advice? He's coming here uh, next week. My, uh, uh, I think what I'd like to say to President Obama, who I worked very hard for, I was the, almost the first person leader to sign up in the Environmentalists for Obama organization. And I think what I'd say is being better than George Bush on climate is nice, but it's not anywhere near good enough. You're not negotiating in the end with the Chinese and the EU and the Senate Republicans. You're negotiating with physics. Uh, and that's a tough negotiation. Physics has laid down its bottom line, 350 parts per million. North of that, the world doesn't work. So your legacy is going to depend on your ability to grapple with that. So far, Obama's done very little heavy lifting on any of this. He hasn't taken it to the Senate and said, you got to do this. He hasn't fired up Air Force One and flown the press corps off to look at Glacier National Park and McMurdo Sound and all the other places that would demonstrate just how serious this problem already is. It's been second tier, back burner. Got to go to work, baby. And I guess he's actually getting his Nobel Peace Prize speech right now in Austin. As we speak, I think that's right. And I have no doubt that he'll give a great speech there and a great speech here. And I love listening to his speeches. They turn me on and make me happy. But uh, we got to get some carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, it's, it's a hard one. It's not a political issue like political issues we're used to dealing with. Obama, in his heart, I think, is a compromiser, which is fine. That's how political issues usually advance. We get 50% of what we want on health care, and we come back in five years and get some more and whatever. This one's different because there are these huge tipping points out there. If we're not able to slow down this rise in temperature before, say, we melt in more of the permafrost and release more methane into the atmosphere, then it's not going to make any difference who's president 10 years from now. They won't be able to any longer do much about it. <laughs>